Great. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks for inviting me to speak tonight on some research that I've been working on recently. And as with so many things, I have to say, uh, the research is ongoing. It's been interrupted by COVID-19, as have so many things. But I wanted to share it with you for two main reasons. First off, I think it's a fun, uh, a fun topic and an interesting mystery. And second, I'm hoping that some of you around New England and with expertise in various areas uh, might have some thoughts on where else I can look, uh, who else I should speak to about trying to figure out who designed Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Swanton, Vermont. So let's get started. Now, we'll start off with some geography for those of you who may not be familiar with the town of Swanton, Vermont. It is located in the far northwest corner of the state, bordered on the west by Lake Champlain, and just eight miles south of the Canadian border. So it's up there as a ways. It's a town of about 6,400 people, and it has a small commercial center located in Swanton Village. Like many Vermont and New England communities, Swanton Village has a beautiful town green, and the south end of the green is anchored by three gable front masonry buildings seen here. And the subject of this talk is Holy Trinity Episcopal Church, shown on the far left background of this image. Here's a better view of Holy Trinity Episcopal Church, showing the original 1876 wooden church on the left and the 1910 stone church on the right. When the stone church was built, the original wooden church was converted for use as a parish hall. And that massive squat stone tower sits right at the junction of the two buildings. They're, they're arranged almost in a V in that, uh, that tower provides access from the old to the new. The original 1876 building is credited to local architect and builder Ira D. Hatch, who designed a simple but appealing wood-framed carpenter Gothic building. And it should be noting, noted that the building shown here was actually taken down and replaced in 2007 with a new building uh, that picks up on many of the stylistic characteristics um, and better serves the needs of the congregation today. So about 30 years after building their wooden church, uh, they had outgrown their building and they constructed a new church in 1910. It's constructed of locally quarried Swanton Royal Marble, which is a, a product for which Swanton quarries are known. And it's designed in a restrained English Gothic revival style with irregular courses of rough faced ashlar blocks and a slate roof. On the interior, uh, we see finishes of Georgia pine, cypress, and oak. This view is looking down the central aisle of the sanctuary towards the altar at the south end of the building. And then looking back the other way, uh, you can see the dominant architectural features of the interior space are these beautiful wooden scissor trusses that support the roof and the large stained glass window at the north end of the sanctuary. Now, the origins of the stone church building are well documented in the vestry minutes, such as this entry in August 1909 that references sketches prepared by the architect Lewis Sheldon Newton of Hartford, Vermont. And at the same time, Vermont newspapers are reporting on the proposed construction of a new church in Swanton and noting that it will be uh, designed by architect Lewis Sheldon Newton. And finally, photographs of the project taken shortly after completion clearly credit uh, the design to Lewis Sheldon Newton, as we can see here. So who was Lewis Sheldon Newton? He was born in Hartford, Vermont in 1871 and studied architecture in Boston under J. Merrill Brown. In the late 1890s, he practiced for a few years uh, with a firm in New Hampshire and then returned to his hometown in Hartford, Vermont and set up his own practice. 
His earliest known commission uh, dates from 1897 in Hartford, Vermont. Within a few years, uh, Newton had established himself as a reliable and competent designer, able to undertake projects such as this three-story Renaissance revival style brick building in White River Junction, Vermont for the local savings bank. And a few years later, uh, this small library building also in White River Junction, designed in a, a vaguely English Gothic medieval style with Tudor arches and leaded, uh, leaded glass diamond pane windows. Um, so clearly he's, he's capable. Um, he's, he's building a good reputation for himself. Far and away, however, the bulk of Newton's commissions in this first decade of his career involve remodeling and updating, uh, if you will, existing buildings, such as the 1807 Warren Kidder House in Woodstock, Vermont. In 1907, a century later, uh, Newton was hired to embellish uh, what was a stately federal style house with a grand uh, scrolled broken pediment dormer on the roof, a palladian window on the second floor, and a, uh, a classical entry porch supported by ionic columns uh, in framing the doorway. And this type of project, there is also a large addition off the rear of this building. This was really Newton's bread and butter in the first decade of the 20th century working on wood framed colonial revival buildings, um, some smaller brick buildings, and a lot of remodeling and addition projects. So for me, this begs the question of how did Newton, who's working almost exclusively on these smaller projects in the vicinity of Woodstock and White River Junction, Vermont, who had never designed a church, who did not work in the Gothic revival style and didn't build or design buildings in stone, how did he come to land the commission for Holy Trinity Episcopal Church all the way up in Swanton, Vermont? So that is the question. And before diving into um, further talk about the Gothic revival in Vermont, um, any discussion of that topic has to mention Bishop John Henry Hopkins, who was the, the first bishop of the Episcopal Diocese in Vermont, appointed in 1832. And four years later, uh, he published his essay on Gothic architecture, which is uh, considered the first published uh, treatise in America on the use of the Gothic architectural style for religious buildings. So an enormously influential book. And uh, Hopkins was himself an architect and designer and designing buildings such as St. Paul's Episcopal Church uh, in Burlington, Vermont, which unfortunately is no longer standing. But there's clearly a, a uh, a very strong uh, lineage of the use of Gothic revival, especially in the Episcopal Diocese in Vermont for church buildings. So that could help explain why the, the 1876 Carpenter Gothic building uh, that we saw earlier and that we see here before the stone edition, why it uses Gothic revival um, details. So about 20 years after uh, the original wooden building is built in Swanton, a new rector arrives in town, Reverend Frederick M. Garland. And he was born in 1864 in Exeter, New Hampshire, and only worked in Swanton for about four years. Uh, he left in 1899, moving to Minnesota, where he worked for a number of parishes until his death in 1938 in Minneapolis. So Garland, uh, within a few months of his arrival at Holy Trinity in Swanton, there's discussion in the vestry minutes about needing, needing to expand the church. The congregation is growing and they're looking at uh, possibly building an addition. Uh, by August of 1895, the vestry votes to uh, build an addition to the existing building, the wood framed building based on plans presented by the secretary 
And this indeed was done. If we look at the Sanborn maps, you can see on the left in 1892, and then uh, comparable scale in 1897, clearly the chapel has been enlarged off uh, with an addition off the back of the building. So they're growing, they're expanding, but they're not quite ready to build a completely new building yet. So the following year, the following spring, April 1896, Reverend Garland gets married. And it's to a local Swanton girl, Miss Mary Emma Hogel. And this typically would not be especially notable for our discussion tonight, except when we look at who is in the wedding party. Reverend Garland's best man was Ralph Adams Cram who's described in the paper as, quote, the well-known architect and author of New York City, end quote. So this clearly places Reverend Garland and Ralph Adams Cram uh, as having a very close connection if he's the best man at Garland's wedding. And they're both in Swanton, Vermont in 1896 for the wedding. So historian Douglas Shantucci has written extensively on uh, the life of Ralph Adam, Adams Cram. And he notes a series of letters exchanged between Cram and Garland in 1895, uh, where they use uh, pseudonyms of Brother Clement for Cram and Brother Anselm for Garland. And there's discussion about possibly starting their own religious order and far more than we can uh, get into in this discussion. But clearly, there's a very close relationship there between Cram and Reverend Garland. And these are letters that I would love to look at when archives are open and accessible again. So Ralph Adams Cram, of course, needs little introduction for this audience. He's regarded as one of the preeminent American architects of the early 20th century, and perhaps best known for his use and promotion of the Gothic revival style for many of his projects. He published his own treatise in 1899 about church building and design and uh, principles of architecture and how he, he thought churches should be designed. And note that uh, Cram was born in Hampton Falls, New Hampshire. And recall that Reverend Garland was born in Exeter, New Hampshire. These two towns are just seven miles apart from each other. And Cram and Garland are just one year apart in age. Did they know each other growing up? Uh, more information, more research is needed here as well to figure out exactly when Cram and Garland uh, crossed paths and how they came to know each other. So in his book, Cram describes different types of religious buildings, including the country chapel, the village church, and the city chapel, which are roughly based in scale in relation to the size of the community that they are serving. So Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Swanton best fits the category of country chapel, which Cram describes as follows, quote, the country chapel, the kind that costs perhaps $5,000 to $10,000 and seats from 100 to 200 people, is almost without exception horrible to the extreme, end quote. He really took issue with the design of these small country churches. And the problem, he thought, was that architects were trying to decorate these buildings too much and add extraneous details and, and fancy flourishes um, to try to make them seem more, more important. Uh, but Cram was really adamant in stating that, quote, there's only one way to build a country chapel, and that's to build it as simply as possible and of as durable materials as possible, end quote. So Cram really emphasized simplicity of design and letting the building and its massing speak for itself. And here are some examples. Uh, Cram's churches can be found throughout New England and the country. Um, but here are examples in Bangor, Maine, Peterborough, New Hampshire, Parish of All Saints in Ashmont, Massachusetts, um, one of Cram's very first church designs, 
and Emmanuel Church in Rhode Island. And you can see they share this, this common language of, of massive solid designs and these, these truncated uh, masonry towers. And in Vermont, Cram designed St. James Episcopal Church in Woodstock in 1907-1908. Now, who else was working in Woodstock in 1907? Our friend, Lewis Sheldon Newton. Now, it's hard to imagine that Newton, as a young and upcoming architect, uh, relatively new to the field, would not have sought out a meeting with Cram while he was in Woodstock uh, for the design of St. James, or at the very least observed construction of the building and how the, uh, the, the design and materials used. Unfortunately, records of Newton's practice um, from the first 20 years or so of his career uh, have yet to be located. So we don't have uh, any definitive information about uh, correspondence or meetings with Cram at that time. But we can say that Newton and Cram were definitely both working on projects in Woodstock, Vermont in 1907, 1908. Returning to Douglas Shand Tucci's book, um, perhaps the most intriguing piece is that uh, he mentions a letter written in 1895 from Reverend Garland to Cram that references a sketch that Cram has made of a church design and sent to Garland. And Garland in this letter is insisting to pay for that sketch should it ever be used for construction in the future. So, Unfortunately, again, we don't know where this sketch is yet. I'm hoping it will turn up because it, it could be the missing link <laughs> to this story. But there was uh, definitely, uh, Cram was working on something and given his close relationship with uh, Garland and having visited the church in Swanton the next year, um, makes one wonder if this was a sketch for a possible uh, new church in Swanton. So there we have it. There's still a lot of questions. Uh, you know, the fundamental question is the building shown here, the work of Lewis Sheldon Newton, uh, as stated in the historical record. Um, but an architect working in the first decade of his career, who had never designed a church, who had never built in stone, and who did not work in the Gothic Revival style, or is it the work of Ralph Adams Cram, uh, perhaps the resurrection of plans that he designed 15 years earlier for Reverend Garland? Maybe it's a little of both. Uh, perhaps Holy Trinity Church uh, reached out to Cram in 1909 and asked if he could uh, develop his plans. Uh, was Cram too busy? Did he recommend Newton uh, to supervise the project and thus Newton got credited with the design? Uh, was Newton involved in the construction of St. James in Woodstock, uh, perhaps serving as supervising architect if Cram uh, was busy with other projects elsewhere in the country? Um, this is all to be determined, um, but I think there are some really interesting overlaps and connections between Cram, Newton, and Reverend Garland uh, that are worthy of further investigation. And certainly if any of you have thoughts or comments, um, ideas on who I should talk to, where else I should look, I would love to hear from you. And my contact information is here and I thank you very much.